Hello. Today, I want to indulge in a different episode. I want to talk about a tool very close to me. I've always loved photography as a medium. The art of capturing frozen moments of time reincarnated is truly mesmerizing. It strikes the perfect balance between something simple in its nature, yet complex in its outcome. I like to think there's a large narrative woven into every single photograph, regardless of how mundane it may be. But enough side talk. The Hasselblad 500CM, a medium format powerhouse of a camera that aches the photographer who wants to shoot medium format with Carl Zeiss lenses. It's truly a beast. And it begins with the 1950s, with the various prototypes of cameras made by Swedish manufacturer Victor Hasselblad. Until 1957, the prototypes dropped its name by half, from the 1000F to the 500C, and subsequently changed from a focal plane shutter to a leaf shutter. The first commercial Hasselblad was born. And subsequently, the Hasselblad 500CM, which is the camera I have right here. This camera right here has traveled 50 years and fallen into the hands of many photographers. Behind its metal housing hides a story of grease and strain. It's been able to withstand the brute force of time and is why many people, especially I, fell in love with this camera. I like to think of time as the greatest filter. And these were one of the few cameras that kind of slipped through the cracks. And through the foresight of Hasselblad themselves, they knew they struck gold. Following the 500CM came modifications that added an ISO control and an automated winder. These were the 500CX, CW, and the 500EL. That last one was a special machine. A version of that model was the camera of choice used by NASA to photograph the moon. If I haven't mentioned it yet, this was the camera trusted by the astronauts of Apollo 11 on their voyage. Truly incredible stuff. But for the video, I want to go a bit deeper into why I adore this camera and take it as my prized possession. This starts by talking about the film photography pipeline, the process of translating subject to exposed film. If we excuse the technical jargon, every film camera has a process of taking the photo. This usually can be broken down into the following elements. Number one, a lens that focuses incoming light into a clean projection. Number two, a film back that holds the film in place to be exposed by that projection. Number three, a shutter to limit that exposure for a given time. Number four, a viewfinder that allows you to frame your shot in the first place. Number five, a winder that initiates the shutter and exposure. And finally, number six, a body that bridges all these elements together. All cameras have elements of these pipeline creatively arranged and how effectively they can communicate these elements together allow the photographer to take the best shot possible. Though cumbersome, I'm breaking apart this process because I want to highlight how the Hasselblad was able to exploit each element in their own unique ways to enhance the photography experience in such a tangible manner. The Hasselblad, being a modular camera, can be broken into these very elements as shown. The film back, the crank of the winder, the lens, the viewfinder, the winder, and the body. Each part allocated a role that contributes to the process of photography. The build of the Hasselblad is superb. From its compact form factor, Hasselblad manages to condense the intricate mechanics into the faces of the body, all while not compromising quality. Every piece, every switch, and every mechanic speaks in perfect synchrony. From the dark slide, to the body, and all the way to the lens. There is what I like to call design harmony. This comes to a story about my first experience shooting the Hasselblad. On framing my shot and pressing the shutter button, I noticed I couldn't. The button was jammed or stuck. I quickly scrambled to find out whether I messed up or broke the damn thing. But unbeknownst to me, the dark slide, this metal piece right here, was still in the film back. This metal plate covers the area of exposed film when you remove the back to ensure your film is always in the dark. But when you have the back in place right to the body and you're ready to shoot, it becomes more of a hindrance. 
as it interferes with the projection onto the film. So the Hasselblad prevents you from shooting your shot if the dark slide is covering the film back. But when it's removed and you aim your shot, I was able to fire. But there's also another added bonus. You can remove the film back if the dark side is not in, ensuring you don't expose your film to the natural light. It's almost as if it's jammed in place. Only once the dark slide is in, you can remove the film back. These kinds of experiences reassure me as a photographer. It's as if Hasselblad knew all the fumbles, the mistakes as a photographer and guided you through it. And that's what I think a camera should be. Something that supports you as a photographer to take your best shot. And this camera certainly does. The lens, this hefty piece located at the front of the camera, focuses incoming light into a clean projection with the various combination of glass optics and by adjusting the distances between them, you can change the point at which all the refracted rays intersect, ideally at the plane of the film. This is the focus of the image and it's controlled using the focusing ring, which is located right here, which moves the lens fixture back and forth. This can compensate for close objects where the rays are almost divergent rather than farther objects where the rays are almost parallel. There's a marker here indicating the rough distance your subject has to be to be in focus, both in meters and feet, going from 0.9 meters to infinity. The ring just above it is the f-stop ring. This controls the aperture of the camera. This affects the size of the opening to the camera and controls the exposure of the film as well as the depth of field. Smaller apertures have a low exposure as less light can traverse through the small opening, but inversely causes a larger depth of field as a portion of light rays that enter tend towards the focal point. That means more objects are in focus. Intuitively, the markers sandwiched between the f-stop and the focus indicate the range of the depth of field, with f22 being the smallest aperture for the camera and having the widest range of focus, indicated by the range of distances shown here. Wider apertures squeeze closer to the chosen focal distance due to the reduced depth of field accordingly but the end is f2.8, the widest aperture this camera can produce, given the largest background separation for images shot with this f-stop. The following ring is a shutter speed, and this controls the duration the time the shutter is open to expose the film, and is the next element of this film pipeline. The shutter is indicated by the reciprocal of the time shown here, so a shutter of 500 is 1 500th of a second open. This being a studio camera, only has a max shutter speed of 500 and the lowest being one for longer exposures. However, there is a bulb or the letter B setting which is used for very long exposures where the shutter is open for as long as the shutter button is held. The orange label numbers at the bottom of the shutter speed are the EV numbers and this coincides with another feature of this lens. These numbers seem like they have no discernible meaning until you notice this arrow here on the f-stop ring. As you can see, the exposure of the image is affected by both the f-stop and the shutter speed. There is an inverse relationship between shutter and aperture on exposure. Turning the f-stop ring affects the placement of the arrow and in turn the EV value, while the turn of the shutter speed changes the placement of the values, changing the EV value as well. EV value becomes a measure of the exposure value of an image and depending on that shutter and the f-stop could be the same this comes to the button on the f-stop ring. On pressing and turning this, you can change both the f-stop and the shutter speed at the same time, compensating for both, ensuring the same exposure value at different intervals. I like this feature, allowing yourself to first nail your exposure, then compensate for both. This becomes useful if you have the additional viewfinder, which its light meter can provide this value. Finally, there is an added lever, and this is the depth of field viewer. It helps by initiating the aperture when framing your shot to see the actual projection the film will be exposed to. Accounting for both the depth of field blur and exposure of your shot, a small flick upwards returns the lens back into its fully open state. I was enamored by the feel of the camera. It struck a perfect balance between the ease of simplicity and the control that comes with complexity in the most needed places. In that fine line lies a tangible aspect of the camera, the ground glass. I always found the ground glass of the Hasselblad something that stood the camera apart from others. 
It wasn't an LCD, it wasn't a display, it was this magical holographic screen that showed an itty bitty theater like view of your shot. There was no deception or lie, the colors were what you see to the naked eye. That depth allowed me to utilize the full planal area of the 6x6 square film to adjust for the composition to align it just right. And there's a lot of latitude that comes with the ground glass. Best to its aid, the format of the film itself. The viewfinder acts as a shade to better see the image framed. The four walled sides and the added magnifying glass all enhance the experience of framing a Hasselblad. And the Hasselblad 500cm has, in my opinion, the most evenly lit ground glass compared to any other camera. The film back houses the film of the camera. It's this semicircular shaped prism that detaches from the back of the Hasselblad. And for reason, the back houses two spools smudged against a metal plate. I can disassemble the film into the cartridge and the back case. The case serves to keep the film in complete darkness when spooled, but also houses the mechanism that controls the film winding. The cartridge houses the spools and the metal plate and makes it easy to insert and take out the film. By using some 120 film, I will show you the process of setting up the film back. The film spool sits on one end and runs through the metal plate and hooks up to the other end of the spool. This process is similar to many other backs of medium format film cameras. And the idea is to expose the film flat on this metal plate so that the projection of the lens exposes the film evenly. And now you begin to see why the film back is shaped the way it is. This is also why the metal plate is propped up using a spring. It serves to apply even pressure to the film to keep it taut. And the rollers here smooth the motion of the film as it rolls through. Then the film cartridge is placed back in its case and in the dark, the film spool is turned to the first frame using the secondary winder. And conveniently, it stops at the first shot indicated by the number dial here. Now it's ready. Transitioning to the next film is controlled by the use of a gear mesh hidden behind the side of the metal facet. Here's a dissected view of the gear assembly. Pretty complex, but the idea is the turn of the main gear here translates to a turn of the spool, which conveyor belts to the other spool and translates to the next area of film. The crank of the winder of the body here exposes that gear that triggers the film to transition to the next film. It beautifully meshes into the film bag, hidden behind when the two are attached. This continues until all 12 shots are taken, for this model at least. There are backs that shoot different formats, such as the A16 back or even the humongous A24. At the end of the 12th shot, the number on the dial indicates 12 shots taken, and with the use of the secondary winder, spools the rest of the film to protect it into the other end of the spool. Now the cartridge can be taken out with the film roll fully exposed. There's a lot more I didn't cover, but I hope I gave the gist of what the film back is. This mechanism is truly magnificent, and I hope you can sense the same enjoyment I have for this. The simple task of a controlled exposure of film becomes so much more complex as we're surrounded by light, which can ruin your shot. Just exposing your film to the lens projection becomes so much more difficult, and it's a marvel in engineering. The body of the camera is the central hub for the entire operation. It bridges all the elements of the pipeline together. And the best way to explain it is to simply go through the process of how a photograph is taken in the first place. The body houses the mirror reflex and the shutter button, where the mirror reflex translates the projection to the viewfinder and allows you to set your shot in the first place. Because this is a mechanical camera, all the energy to run it comes from the crank of the winder. This starts the cascading process of taking your shot. The camera functions by initiating a high state of potential energy, as shown before, stored from the crank of the winder. The shutter proceeds to trigger these new states of equilibria back to its resting state, and resulting the mechanism that triggers the process of photography. The crank of the winder initiates four steps. One lowers the mirror inside the body into a new state of equilibria, with the mirror propped 45 degrees, casting the projection upwards to the ground glass. This is only momentary as it's in a state of high potential energy, waiting for it to be flipped back up to the top of the body. 
Number two, the winder initiates the gear mechanism that meshes with the gear hidden in the film back as shown before. Initially hidden, the gear is merely cleft on its side and on turning it, pokes out and into the slot on the film back here, winding it to the next frame, triggering both the count on the viewfinder and the red dot right here, turning it white to indicate a cocked winder. Number three, the crank of the winder through the gear train of the camera winds the lens of the camera. As you can see, this notch turns anti-clockwise, designed to mesh with this nail-like head on the lens, similar to that of a crank of a flathead screwdriver. This winds the lens into a state of high potential energy, which is used to trigger the shutter. The leaf shutter slowly curls open, revealing the mirror inside of the body. Four, and finally, the winder initiates the shutter release, which is the trigger for the entire photography process. Now when your shot is ready and framed, the shutter button is pressed and it all collapses down. The mirror reflex swings back up to the viewfinder and the doors of the back of the body spring open to the top and the bottom to reveal the film pressed against the back of the body. In the meantime, the lens does three things. One, the aperture collapses inwards to the desired opening. Two, the internal clock in the lens holds for a moment chosen by the desired shutter speed and closes the leaf shutter, sealing the exposure. And finally, the mill nub here protrudes outward to trigger the film back that the shot has been taken, indicated by the white dot turning red. And voila, an exposed film for a given exposure of time and a controlled aperture. Truly marvelous how these things unfold, not to mention all mechanical. There are a few things to note here. These two dots here indicate the state of the film back and the body. White indicating cocked and ready and red indicating triggered and exposed. Because these are detachable, you could wind the body without winding the back. And on placing the back, notice there's a misalignment. A very helpful note by Hasselblad themselves. Very neat. This just scratches the surface of the camera. And I'm not doing it justice to this video. I understand that not everyone needs a doctorate in the engineering of a film camera, especially this one. But I hope I gave a glimpse into how complex this art truly is. The process of exposing light sensitive film to capture an image becomes more than that. It's truly simple in its nature, yet so complex in its outcome. We as humans find such creative ways to exploit the world around us to our will. I think that's a magical aspect to us. These kinds of tools help us find new ways to experience it. And I especially encourage film cameras as a way to appreciate that. I know, I know, many would scorn at the added complexity, touting digital cameras to be simpler and more effective. And to them, I say this. Sometimes learning the times table is useful, even though you could just use a calculator. The idea of why 7 times 7 is 49 is more valuable than the act of knowing how to push a few buttons. And is why the act of experiencing the process of how film works enhances your ability as a photographer to exploit the world around you, play with it, and compose your best shot. So thank you, Victor Hasselblad. Because in 50 years and still kicking it, it amazes me what humans can do with ingenuity. Thank you for watching this video. It really means a lot to me. And this is the first episode in an ongoing series, or at least I hope an ongoing series about film cameras. And I really appreciate it if you take the time to comment, give me your thoughts, your ideas, your opinions on this, because it means a lot. So, yep, goodbye.